I was just welcoming you all for being here and thanking Dr. Azim Ibrahim for joining us for this important conversation about what is really a human rights and humanitarian crisis unfolding in Southeast Asia. And I was going to ask you if you could just start from the beginning. Who are the Rohingya? Why are they subjected to such persecution? Thank you so much, Beth, for that uh, introduction and Evelyn for that kind uh, intro and uh, George for putting this uh, event together. It's a great honour and privilege for me to be here at the World Affairs Council and the Commonwealth Club. Uh, so I, I essentially came across the Rohingya uh, issue over half a decade ago. Um, I read somewhere that the Rohingya are the most persecuted minority in the world. And then I tried to find out more about them. And then I was very surprised to see that there's absolutely nothing on this minority anywhere. You know, there was no books written on the Rohingya. There were no papers. There was no campaigns. There was no celebrity endorsements. And I was genuinely quite surprised to see, that, you know, not, they are literally, they were known by the United Nations as the most persecuted minority, but also the forgotten, the forgotten people. You know, and I, I spent a number of years writing op-eds and everything else on, on this. And then I made a trip to the region both to Myanmar, I went to the camps in Rakhine, which are now completely closed to the outside, and then also to Bangladesh, to some of the refugee camps there. I then went to Malaysia and Thailand to investigate some of the trafficking routes, and the book was a product of that. So the Rohingya are essentially, to answer your question, they're essentially a minority ethnic group within Myanmar. Uh, nobody knows a precise number of how many Rohingya they are because they, just, they don't exist Myanmar does not recognize them. Uh, they, they don't recognize them as being citizens of Myanmar. They, they see them as being illegal immigrants from Bangladesh. Um, uh, so no official numbers actually exist of how many they are. But estimates claim that there are about 2 to 2.2 million of Rohingya altogether. So this is an ethnic minority group <clears throat> that is the largest minority within Myanmar. Myanmar has over 140 ethnicities, minority groups. This is one of the largest ones. They make up uh, about 5% of the population of, uh, of Myanmar. And they, the persecution of the Rohingya, to understand where all of this started, you have to take a step back into history. You know, the persecution really started when the Japanese invaded what was at that time British Burma during World War II. When the Japanese invaded, the majority Buddhist population sided with the Japanese invaders, believing that the Japanese are going to be victorious and this is going to lead to swifter independence from these British uh, colonialists. Whereas the Rohingya minority stayed loyal to the British colonial masters. So when the country did become independent in 1948, there was bad blood between the two people, between the Buddhist majority and the Rohingya minority. And so the Rohingya were seen as, as the fifth columnist, as being, they did not support the Buddhist majority during their time of uh, difficulty. They were seen as being essentially, um, uh, you know, the, the, uh, an alien entity within the country. But despite that, there was relative calm up until 1962, when there was a coup by the military chief, General Nguyen. General Nguyen, essentially, he, as soon as he came to power, he tried to implement what he called the Burmese Road, to socialism, which was a communist manifesto, which was a complete economic disaster. So he did what a lot of dictators do in that situation when things start to go wrong, is that they try to find scapegoats on whom to blame all the ills of society on. And the Rohingya minority, who were already looked at with suspicion, who were already different, had a different language, a different skin colour, a different uh, religion, different culture. They were the perfect minority of choice to blame these ills of society on. And what General Ne Win did is he became much more overtly Buddhist in his outlook as well. He started making statements like only Buddhists can be loyal citizens to this country. To be Burmese, to be Buddhist is to be Burmese, and nobody else can possibly be a loyal a loyal citizen to this country. And he passed a number of laws which culminated in the nineteen. 82 Citizenship Act, which stripped all the Rohingya of their nationality, making them amongst the largest stateless group in the world. Um, uh, so, but this, and after that point, the Rohingya faced wave after wave of violence by these extreme elements within society, extreme militant Buddhists elements that essentially said that look, these people were never Bud they were never Burmese, they're all illegal immigrants from Bangladesh, and they should all just go back to Bangladesh. And we've seen this culminate in the most recent crisis, which erupted last year 
that expelled, uh, which the United Nations has now classified as a genocide and expelled you know hundreds of thousands, over 700,000 Rohingya uh, into Bangladesh from, from Myanmar. Can you talk a little bit about what precipitated the most recent crisis starting in August? Um, the Rohingya had never really had any form of an armed opposition, and yet there were allegations that they had formed them, that they're terrorists, that there were attacks on various police outposts, yeah. et cetera. How much validity is there to that, and is, or is that just a pretext for, for further violence? Yeah. So the, the Myanmar military in October 2017 claimed that they are reacting to a, a militant attack by an organization called ARSA, which is the Arakan Rohingya Salvation Army. And what the Arakan and what the Myanmar military is doing is essentially uh, countering that attack. So there was an attack on a number of police and security outposts that left about a dozen uh, Myanmar security officials dead. And then the Myanmar military essentially clamped down and uh, you know invaded all these Rohingya villages and burnt most of them, if not all of them, to the ground and expelled 700,000 Rohingya. Um, you know, the, one of the difficulties with this narrative is that uh is that uh, if you look at ARSA as an organisation itself, there's a lot of conspiracy theories that are float around that, well, these people didn't actually ever exist, and they're all just a, an entity that the Myanmar military has, has created themselves to justify this action. Now, I don't accept those conspiracy theories, um, uh, but despite that, if you look at ARSA itself as an organisation, you know, if you look at any of these militant videos of these terrorist organisations, they all ha have a very similar kind of format. You know, you see one individual uh, and you see a number of individuals in front of a camera. One of them would be reading a statement, uh, and most of them behind them will be holding their rocket launchers and the Kalashnikovs and all the heavy weaponry and arsenal. And the whole purpose of this is to demonstrate power and strength. And if you watch the ARSA videos, there'll be one guy reading a statement, two or three of them will be holding Kalashnikovs, the rest of them are, are holding bamboo sticks and knives. You know, all of them are bare feet, they all look thoroughly malnourished. These are, these are not, irrespective of what you think of them, these are not a credible security threat to justify this level of violence that the Myanmar military has, uh, has uh, perpetuated onto the Rohingya population. And that, that is not my interpretation. That is now the official interpretation of the United Nations. And despite that, you know, one of the, one of the key questions that I get asked very often is that why did this happen now? One of the arguments I make in my book is that, you know, the Myanmar authorities have been persecuting the Rohingya for half a century. For half a century, they have been persecuted. The UN said they're the most persecuted minority. And so why did this happen now in 2017 on such a large scale? And I believe you know, if, if you study genocides, it is very common for the perpetrators of a genocide to undertake a dry run, to undertake a test run, to examine what is going to be the reaction, not just of local actors, but of the international community. Can we get away with this? You know, are we able to actually execute the final solution and get away with this? So the same thing happened in Rwanda. It didn't happen all of a sudden. The military, the uh, the um, um, the you know the genociders in Rwanda undertook a test run. You know, before that, the Myanmar military undertook a test run of this in August 2016. In August 2016, they invaded a number of Rohingya villages. They burnt dozens of them to the ground. Human Rights Watch obtained all the satellite imagery that showed you the villages before and after. They expelled over 140,000 Rohingya into Bangladesh. And the military learnt three critical lessons from this exercise. The first thing that they learnt is that Aung San Suu Kyi defends the military in public. The Aung San Suu Kyi became a shield for all criticism against the military in the public domain. For example, in March 2017, the United Nations produced a report to say that 52% of Rohingya women that reached the camps in Bangladesh had been raped. So the majority of them had been raped. Aung San Suu Kyi said, this is fake rape. This was her words. This is fake rape. When the BBC's journalist, Fergo Keane, said to her in an interview, ethnic cleansing is happening in your country, she said, ethnic cleansing is far too strong a term to use for what is happening. Both sides are equally to blame. So drawing a moral equivalence between the aggressor 
and the victims. So this is, that's the equivalent of saying, you know, you know, the Jews were equally to blame for the Holocaust as the Nazis. Is that drawing a moral moral equivalence? You know, when the UN Commission, when the UN uh, uh, UN Human Rights Commission said we should have a full scale Human Rights Commission inquiry, also in March 2017, she said, and this she said in a TV interview, she said this will not be very helpful, and it was her office that blocked the visas for the UN. So I accept that Aung San Suu Kyi does not control the military. She does not direct the military, but she is the foreign minister of that country. She controls all the visas for that country, and she refused, even to this day, she refuses access to the UN, saying this is not going to be, her words, this is not going to be very helpful. So that's the first thing the military learned, the most important lesson, is that Aung San Suu Kyi defends the military in public. She became a shield for all criticism against the military in the public domain. The second thing that they learned is that despite all the evidence Despite all the evidence of, you know, killings, mass atrocities, mass grave, rape camp, burning villages, the military chief, General Min Ong Ling, was still given a VIP invitation to Europe. Austria and Germany in particular literally rolled out a red carpet for him. And he visited, you know, he's treated like a, a foreign dignitary. And I wrote to both of their ambassadors, Austria and Germany, to the ambassadors in Washington and at the UN, and I informed them, and I published those letters online on the Huffington Post. Uh, on in, uh, uh, I think it was in, in, it was basically three months before the crisis erupted. And I said that, you know, General Min Ong Ling is on a spending spree around Europe, re rearming his military because they are preparing for a massive offensive. This entire region in the decline is now being militarized because they are preparing for a massive, a massive offensive. And those letters are published online; they're in the public domain, so they cannot say that we had no idea any of this was going to happen. That's the second thing that they learned: is that despite evidence of mass atrocities, he's still treated as a VIP on on the global stage. The third thing they learned is that the military suddenly and Myanmar became very popular. The military in Myanmar was very unpopular, which is what forced them to have elections in the first place. You know, they didn't want to have elections, which brought Dosu to power, but forced them to have elections. But after this exercise against the Rohingya, the military suddenly became very popular as the defenders of Buddhist values against these hordes of invading Muslims, illegal Bengali Muslims. So the military realized that, look, we've actually suddenly become very popular. So the military learned these three critical lessons you know, after the exercise, the test run, the dry run, and they decided that, look, we can actually execute the final solution and we will probably get away with it. And that's precisely what happened. So your book, which is really a remarkable piece of work, I can commend it to everyone here, the, the history is fascinating to read, is called The Hidden Genocide. So can we talk a little bit about the word genocide? It's obviously a very weighted term. Um, under the law, it means um, a whole range of violent acts committed against a protected group with the intent to destroy that group in whole or in part. That's really the element that defines genocide. Um, in your 2016 edition of the book, you warn that we're on the brink of genocide. Um, in the new version, which you'll have a signing for this evening, you actually say you think a full-scale genocide is underway. Talk us through your thinking on that. Yeah. So the original book, it was, you know, it was called The Rohingyas Inside Myanmar's Hidden Genocide. And the argument I made there is that this is a slow-motion genocide that is happening. Now, genocide has a very technical legal definition, which Beth can allude to much more as an international, as an international lawyer, you know, in the new book or the new edition of the book is just inside Myanmar's genocide. The word hidden has now been removed because it is no longer hidden. You know, I've always made the argument that the Rohingya are. I've always believed that they're the victims of genocide. The word genocide has very significant legal connotations. Um, for me, this argument in its entirety has always been a red herring. This entire argument in any crisis, in any situation, is this a genocide or is not a genocide? It's, uh, you know, th this is an argument of semantics. To me, the issue is that there are mass atrocities going on, and that's the only thing that should matter. You know, the countries around the globe will play around with these worlds. The United Nations has now said in two reports that this is they consider this to be a genocide. The United States, the State Department report that came out recently, uh, kind of avoided that question. And why did the US avoid that question? Well, once it's classified as an official genocide, the US, along with this UN Security Council, has legal obligations 
under the Genocide Convention to intervene and do something. When there is no political appetite to do something, then they'll start playing with words, you know, as, oh, it's not genocide, it's ethnic cleansing, it's mass atrocities, you know, it's war crimes or whatever it may be. And it's very telling, I, I, you know, that Rwanda, and when 800,000 people, 800,000 people were killed in a month and they weren't shot or gassed, they were chopped up by machetes, that was not classified as a genocide at that time. And it was very telling that uh, there was, a, there's a, there was a, a, a memo that went, that was being recently been de either been declassified or it was a leaked. And it was literally just a couple of lines and it went from, I think, the White House, uh, it went from the Pentagon to the White House. And it was literally two lines uh, in 1994 about the Rwandan genocide. And all it said was, be careful, be careful, legal at state, trying to classify this as genocide will compel us to do something. So this was the thinking in 1994, uh, you know, between the Pentagon, the Department of Defense and the White House is that look, legal, there's legal lawyers at the State Department that are trying to make this into a genocide. Once it's classified genocide, it will compel us to do something. So essentially avoid it at all, at as many ways as you can. And that's essentially a very similar situation here. When there is no political appetite to intervene, then there'll be no intervention and they'll play around with these words. And in my, my, my position has, has always been that this is essentially immaterial, you know, whether it's genocide or not. The fact is that there are mass atrocities going on on, a, on an industrial scale. You know, mass graves have been discovered, you know, houses have been burnt. Uh, on all of this evidence is available, you know, by like satellite imagery and everything else, you know. Um, uh, uh, so the argument of genocide, maybe you, I think you could probably talk more about on the, on the genocide aspect of it. Yeah, no, it's quite, it. It, that's quite helpful. I, I want to talk a little bit about the modalities of violence. Yeah. And here we are in the neighborhood of Silicon Valley. And there was a recent study over the Berkeley Human Rights Center talking about how Facebook was used to incite violence, to spread hate speech, that there were bots that the military had set up, fake accounts that were set up to sort of bounce um, information around. Um, could you talk a little bit about whether you think Facebook has done enough to help quell this and what more they could be doing um, so that their platform isn't used to essentially perpetuate a genocide? Yeah. Well, Facebook, according to the UN and according to the New York Times, who first kind of broke the story, has, has been one of the main platforms in which this hate speech was spread. And uh, they're far too slow um, uh, to counter it. And much of the hate speech, you know, was, was spread by these, uh, now that we know, by these troll accounts that were created by the Myanmar military to create anti-Rohingya sentiment. And much of the information was, was clearly fabricated about, you know, Rohingya militants raping Rakhine women and, you know, carrying out mass atrocities and, uh, and uh, all, all this kind of stuff. And much of the f imagery was fabricated as well. So they used a lot of imagery from the tsunami in Japan, you know, when you had bodies piled, piles and piles of bodies, uh, of dead, and they said, "Well, look, this is what the Rohingya are actually doing uh, to the to to the Burmese locals." So, and uh, Facebook was warned of this numerous times, and they, they just didn't take any action uh, for a number of reasons. I believe I think they were well out of their depth in terms of understanding what was going on. You know, Facebook is an, is, an, is an entity that has grown what business people will call uncontrolled growth. You know, it's grown at such a vast scale that they've simply lost control, I believe, of a lot of them, of a lot of the, um, uh, the levers by which to try to put an end to this hate speech. Whether they've done enough now, well, the genocide happened now. You know, 700,000 people have been expelled, all the villages have been burnt. Whether they, you know, I think now they've recognised that they had a part to play in this. And, uh, you know, Facebook was one of the main vehicles by which to spread this misinformation that created uh, the hate speech. You know, I'm, uh, you know, genocides never happen in a vacuum. You know, people don't decide one day just to wake up and kill their neighbours. It takes actually m decades takes a long time to dehumanize somebody to the extent that you no longer see them as human beings anymore. You know, that they are willing to actually go to your neighbor's house and, and kill them and kill their family and people that you've, that you've known all your life. So that hatred was certainly supercharged you know, it was going on for many decades and it was actually going on through the official print media. And the way that it would happen in Myanmar is actually through cartoons. The political cartoons would be used, um, uh, but it was supercharged by Facebook, which ex kind of just accelerated, accelerated the whole process. Can you speak a little bit about where Bangladesh in, is in all this? There's about a million and point two. Again, the numbers are very difficult to pin down. Um, individuals who have, have either been 
forcibly pushed across the border or have fled coercive acts that were happening in Myanmar. They're now sitting in this enormous refugee camp in Cox's Bazar. How is Bangladesh doing? It's one of the poorest countries on earth. And is there more that the international community can be doing to support them, to help them with this influx of individuals? Yeah, so Bangladesh is, uh, was very generous, in the, uh, particularly in the early stages, that they managed to absorb this many, this many um, uh, refugees. You know, you talk, you're talking about uh, 700,000 refugees coming over in a very, very short period of time. Um, uh, Bangladesh is one of the poorest and most densely populated countries in the world, so it's very difficult for them to essentially absorb those kinds of numbers, but they worked very swiftly to try to cater uh, <coughs> for those refugees Unfortunately, I believe that Bangladesh made some critical errors in the early stages of this crisis. Uh, first of all, they tried to enter into negotiations with Myanmar to try to figure out a way in terms of repatriating uh, the Rohingya back to back to uh, Myanmar. And uh, you know, I wrote a piece when this first agreement was first announced in November of last year, exactly one year ago. Now, I wrote a piece in the New York Times in which I argued that you know this entire exercise of negotiating with Myanmar is simply a ruse. You know, Myanmar has spent half a century trying to get rid of these people and now that they have managed to get rid of them there's no way they're going to take them back you know and what exactly will the refugees be going back to you know all their villages have been burnt down have been bulldozed the land has been seized and has already been redistributed and has already been redeveloped by the local Rakhine, Rakhine Buddha, so they've got nothing to actually go back to. And Bangladesh, by entering into this uh, futile exercise, is simply wasting time. And one year or a few years from now, they realize that uh, you know Myanmar is simply buying time until world attention moves on to the next crisis and those refugees become a permanent fixture in Bangladesh. And Bangladesh will then be left with 1.2 million refugees, which are costing over $900 million a year. And uh, you will not be able to fundraise for those kinds of refugees. So, I, you know, my advice, and I met with some Bangladeshi officials at the early stages, is that you know you should pursue legal a, a legal recourse to the International Criminal Court uh, rather than trying to enter into negotiations. And the reason I knew this is because Myanmar has done this a number of times before. You know, they've done this in the 1980s. They did this in 92, and 93, and 97, 98, 2012, 2013, 2016. And in each time, they enter into negotiations, or oh, we want to take these Rohingya back. And then what they do is that they take back maybe a few dozen, a few hundred families as, as a token gesture. And those families are then placed into these concentration camps. And uh, you, you see the images of them. They literally are concentration camps surrounded completely by barbed wire. And I've been to some of them. I've seen them myself. And those Rohingya are not allowed to leave. They're not allowed to essentially, you know, rejoin society in any shape. They're just kept in those camps in these open air in these open air prisons. So Bangladesh was very generous in the early stages, but I believe that they made some gross tactical uh, errors. So you mentioned the International Criminal Court, and the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court recently sought an advisory opinion from the court as to whether or not the ICC, the International Criminal Court, might have jurisdiction over these events. The rule is that the court only has jurisdiction if either the state of nationality of the accused or the state on whose territory the crimes have happened have ratified the ICC statute, or the Security Council can act. China is currently blocking any efforts in this regard, so the Security Council is not an option. Myanmar is not a member of the court, but Bangladesh is. And so the question the prosecutor asked was, given that deportation involves crossing an international border, is there some way that we can sort of back into ICC jurisdiction by virtue of the fact that Bangladesh has joined the court? Um, the court, interestingly ruled, kind of gave her more than she asked for, said not only do you have jurisdiction over deportations potentially, but because the harm is being suffered in neighboring Bangladesh, maybe you have jurisdiction over acts of persecution, acts of cruel treatment. They didn't say the word genocide, but genocide involves the imposition of serious harm to individuals, which is being felt in Bangladesh. How do you think this is going to change the dynamics? The prosecutor has opened an inquiry. Where do you think, is that likely to exert any sort of deterrent effect? Well, well, I certainly hope so. You know, ICC, uh, I, as you mentioned, you know, Myanmar is currently being protected by China. Uh, another, uh, another question I get asked very often, you know, why has the international community been so slow in uh, reacting to this? You know, why has there been absolutely almost no reaction at all from the international community? And, uh, you know, and, uh, when President Obama was in office, he visited Myanmar on two occasions. And for any country to get a visit from the President of the United States is a big deal. 
It's a big deal for that country. Now, why did Obama visit on two occasions? Myanmar has been one of the most closed and most suspicious societies in the world. You know, it's almost like North Korea. It was very, very closed, didn't want, very suspicious of outsiders. The United States is deeply concerned that as Myanmar opens up, it's going to fall under the sphere of influence of China. The entire Southeast Asia is now being redeveloped for one purpose, and that's to meet China's insatiable demand for resources. You look at a country, if you visit a country like Pakistan, everywhere you see signs that say CPAC, China Pakistan Economic Corridor. China has invested 60 billion, over $62 billion in Pakistan, a country that nobody even wanted to touch with a barge pole. China has invested massive roads, bridges, highways, everywhere you go, dams built by Chinese money. Exactly the same thing is happening in, in Myanmar, is that China has massive amounts of investment you know, through their Belt and Road Initiative. China wants access to Myanmar because it gives them access to the Bay of Bengal and the Indian Ocean. China has ambitions to become a global superpower. But before it can become a global superpower, it must become a regional power. And that means keeping its regional nuclear rival India in check. Access to Myanmar gives it access to the Indian Ocean and the Bay of Bengal, avoiding the states of Malacca around, allowing them to keep India in check. So you have here United States trying to keep Myanmar out of the sphere of influence of China and China trying to get access to it. So you have these large geopolitical machinations going on between superpowers, you know, nuclear superpowers. And then you insert this minority group called the Rohingya, who nobody's ever heard of. It simply doesn't fit into that calculation by any of these superpowers. So that's one of the reasons why there's been no, there's been no kind of uh, reaction. China has always um, uh, essentially, uh, you know, protected, protecting Myanmar. Um, uh, you know, uh, you know I, I believe that, uh, you know, I wrote a piece in Foreign Policy magazine earlier this year, and, uh, which was titled, First They Came for the Rohingya. Now there is considerable evidence that, and I published this in my in my piece, uh, there's considerable evidence that the Myanmar authorities, having got rid of the country of the Rohingya and having gotten away with it, an emboldened military is now turning their attention onto other minorities in the country. Myanmar is a country that's been at war with every single ethnic minority since independence. These are the longest running civil wars in the world. The same divisions that were deployed to... Uh, attacked the Rohingya, Division 33 and 99. They're also known as the tip of the spear. They are famous for war crimes and atrocities. They have also now been deployed to the north to tackle the insurgencies against the Karen, the Shan and the Sheen, other Christian minorities. And the argument I make is that if you allow one genocide to happen, you're opening the door to many others. And that's precisely what's happening. Unless the International Criminal Court takes a very firm stance and holds those perpetrators to account, you will see this repeated over and over again. And they will not rest until they create a pure Burmese, uh, a, a Burmese Buddhist state. So we've got some really great questions from the audience. I'm going to turn to those now. One from the audience says, how does the movement against the Rohingya fit into general sort of anti-Muslim sentiment that we're seeing in a number of places, including China, the United States, <clears throat> elsewhere? Yeah. Well, obviously, one of the, when this crisis first erupted, when people heard that the Rohingya were majority Muslim, and there are other, you know, there's some Hindus and Sikhs and so on within the Rohingya, but the majority of them are almost exclusively Muslim. And uh, one of the difficulties was is to try to make a case for them. You know, where people said, well, and this is and this is a challenge that they had is that well there must be something there that they're up to, you know. The, the after all they are Muslims. But it was interesting that when Aung San Suu Kyi came to power, you know, one of the first things she did was she commission she she set up this commission, uh, a conference called the Pong Long Two, which was the second one. Uh, the first one was actually started by the founders of of Burma to bring the, all the ethnicities together, get them around the table, and discuss how they can all cooperate. And it wasn't very successful. She she set, set up another one called the Pong long too, in which she invited every ethnic minority group, you know, the Karen, the Sheen and so on, to come round the table and have a discussion in terms of essentially peace talks. The Rohingya were not invited. The Rohingya were not invited to this. And the reason why is because they did not have a military wing. All these other ethnic minorities had organized military wings. They had 
you know, actual trained troops and the Rohingya simply did not. They were essentially the most disenfranchised people. So they've never really been a, a, a violent minority at all. You know, and, uh, this, like I said earlier, the, the organisation that claims to represent the military wing, ARSA, literally appeared just about two years ago. And even that was surrounded with extreme suspicion how they came about and, you know, who they represented. I've been to the Rohingya camps. I never met anybody that supported them. I spoke to almost, you know, dozens of people and uh, ne never did I meet anybody that supported them. So they've never really been a militant, radicalised kind of group of people. I also do know of organisations in Pakistan and elsewhere that try to go to Bangladesh and Myanmar and try to incite some of them. To, to become violent, but uh, I, I, I didn't have much traction. They weren't very successful. And this cause hasn't really been taken up by the Muslim world either, simply because the Rohingya are so low down the food chain in terms of, uh, uh, in, in terms of their status and their ability. Great, well we have a really interesting question here about um, persecution generally, and often you have this sort of articulated reason, but then underneath there are often economic yeah. issues at play. What are the economics here? Does the military stand to gain the Rakhine citizens? How is that playing out? Yeah. Well, I've, I've heard this argument before that, well, look, the, the entire purpose of this uh, en enterprise to get rid of the Rohingya is because this land, the Rakhine region, is very fertile. It's very, you know, the Chinese want to build a pipeline through it and, and so on. So they wanted to remove the Rohingya. I did look into this and I really couldn't find much evidence for this at all. You know, there may be some economic benefit, but I don't believe that was a principle that I don't believe economics was the principal motivation behind this. I do believe it was ethno, uh, you know, ethno nationalism. That was essentially the principal kind of motivation to try to get rid of this minority. And we can see this because they're trying to get rid of all the other minorities as well. You know, it wasn't just the Rohingya. The Rohingya were just the largest and the most visible ones. But uh, you know, all the other minorities are now being targeted as well in a very, very brutal, brutal fashion. What about climate change? Is that at all a factor in Myanmar? And to what extent are the people in Cox's Bazaar now at dire risk of climate change happening from the Bangladeshi side? You know, climate change is going to be a big, big, is one of the big challenges and one of the big calculations that Bangladesh has to make because, as I said, it's one of the most densely populated countries in the world. And every year the landmass is shrinking because of rising sea levels and climate change. You know, so it's very difficult for Bangladesh to host you know, over a million refugees in one of the most densely populated refugee camps, uh, populated areas in the world. And I've been to the camp in Cox's Bazaar a number of times, and it is really quite astonishing. And I've been to refugee camps all over the world. I've been to the ones in Turkey and Syria and Jordan and uh, elsewhere. And uh, the ones in Cox's Bazaar, you know, you can literally climb the highest hill climb the highest, uh, you know, hill that you can find and all around you that you look it, over the horizon, it's just a sea of humanity. It's, it really is something else. It's the largest 1.2 million people all crammed in and living in these, essentially in just in mud, living in bamboo and, and, and plastic. Uh, it really is a, 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 a really bizarre, bizarre sight. So Bangladesh is obviously not very keen on hosting them for too long. So they are very keen on trying to repatriate them as soon as possible. It's an election year in Bangladesh, so one of the platforms that the Prime Minister stood upon is that these Rohingya refugees will never become a burden in Bangladesh. So Bangladesh doesn't even call them Rohingya refugees, they call them forcibly displaced people from Myanmar. Yeah, Because once you call them a refugee, they have rights. Refugees by the International Refugee Convention have certain rights. They have pathways to citizenship. They have, you know, all sorts of rights. In Bangladesh, the, you know, it is forbidden for a Rohingya to get into a motor vehicle. It is forbidden for a Rohingya to get into, physically, into a motor vehicle. So they cannot enter into a taxi, car, or ambulance. It is forbidden for any telecom telecommunications provider to give them a SIM card. No, they cannot provide that to any Rohingya. You know, so they made sure, and the organization that's managing the refugee camps is not the UNHCR, it's the IOM, the Organization of Migration from the UN. And they did, the Bangladeshi government did that on purpose to ensure that these are not refugees. UNHCR has got no function here. It's essentially the organization of migration. So the prime minister is very keen on ensuring that these Rohingya do not become permanent in Bangladesh. We're either going to repatriate them or we're going to put them on this. They've developed this island. And this is a really bizarre plan. They this island that emerged from the sea, 
it emerged actually from the sea called Bashanchar, and it only appeared, you know, a few decades ago. This island is now being redeveloped by Chinese contractors to make it habitable because it's completely uninhabitable now, so they're building sea defences and so on. So they want to move a few ten, tens of thousands of Rohingya onto this island. Now, I managed, when I was there, I, I managed to get not onto the island, but I managed to get far enough to see the island. And uh, I was told by, the, my, by my guide that, look, this island emerged from the sea. It can literally just disappear. You know, but this is essentially the, the, the platform on which uh, the Bangladeshi government is standing on. So we have a question here about whether the Nobel Committee might rescind yeah. the award that was given to Aung San Suu Kyi. I think they've said they can't or yeah. won't, but what, what other forms, what role can she play here? Is, is she a true Burmese nationalist, as we have begun to suspect, or do you think she is trying to do the right thing from the inside and she's just being outflanked by the military and the civilian government is just too weak and, and unstable that she doesn't want to risk it? What, 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 other, what levers do we have with respect to her and her sort of standing as this, what used to be a human rights yeah. champion? Yeah, no, and that's a great question and a, and a very, very common question. You know, uh, I get asked very often is that why has there been so little reaction from the international community? A, a principal reason, as I've articulated earlier, is because of the role of China and the US, you know, playing geopolitics in this region. Another key factor is the role of Aung San Suu Kyi. You know, I meet policymakers at the highest level who still tell me that, well, look, you know, Myanmar is a flawed democracy, it's imperfect, but it's moving in the right direction. And we don't want to upset that. We don't want to upset that, you know, certainly. And we need to give Aung San Suu Kyi more time. And this is a, this is a complete misunderstanding of, of the situation. You know, I wrote, a, I wrote an article, a very long article in Newsweek uh, earlier the, uh, last year in, uh, in which it was called How We Were Seduced by Aung San Suu Kyi. And for that piece, I interviewed half a dozen people who had known her intimately, who had known her intimately for decades. So one of them, for example, is the founder of the free Aung San Suu Kyi campaign back in the 80s. You know, he was actually one of the founders of that. Another individual used to smuggle papers to her in prison, that huge risk to himself. And then there was an Australian member of parliament who was the first Westerner to meet with her when she was released from house arrest and became friends with her. All of them told me on the record that she, Aung San Suu Kyi is a Burmese Buddhist nationalist. Yeah, you look at some of her early writings, she's always had these views. Almost all the elite in Burma have these views. Why are you surprised? Why are you surprised? And the reason I believe that we are surprised is because the whole concept of Aung San Suu Kyi is something that we in the West have a need for. We have a need for this more so than any other. You know, look at our story. It's one of the best stories you'll ever hear. The daughter of one of the founding generals of Myanmar, placed under house arrest by her father's former colleagues, you know, beautiful, educated, Oxford educated, speaks the Queen's English. You know, now she's out of prison. She's opening up her country to democracy and human rights and free markets. Uh, this is fantastic. You know, this is the kind of stuff we make movies out of, you know, and we didn't make a movie out of that. You know, we, 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 put these, we put people on a pedestal because we have a need of our cultural superiority. We like to believe that these people have come to our country and have tasted our democracy. They speak like us. Now they're going to go back to their own backward countries and turn their backward country into our country. And we make this mistake over and over again. Look, for example, I can give you so many examples. Saif al-Gaddafi, PhD from the London School of Economics, who's going to change his country, you know, from the Gaddafi. Or Bashar al-Assad, the London-trained ophthalmologist that's being quoted by Tony Blair as the great reformer of his country. He's turned out to be one of the greatest mass murderers of our time. You know, Kim Jong-un, you know. Loves basket. It's educated at Swiss boarding school. He loves basketball. Loves Disneyland. You know, it's fantastic. This is the kind of and he's threatening us all with nuclear annihilation. You know, this is the, the, we make this mistake over and over again because this is a need that we have. We like to have our heroes on a pedestal. We like to have them untarnished, and we like to believe that these people they've tasted our democracy. Now they're going to come and change their back, and they're all backward. Of course, they're going to change their backward countries into our country without realizing that these people are ideologically committed. They have an ideology, you know, whether it's the Saudi princes or whether it's Bashar al-Assad or anybody else, is that they're, they're simply not going to change because they've sp spent some time at West Point or Sandhurst or Georgetown or Oxford. 
you know, so it's much more to do with us than anything else. You know, and Aung San Suu Kyi, as I, as I mentioned, has played an absolutely critical role. I don't believe any of this would have happened if she wasn't in power to actually not directly facilitate this, but certainly indirectly lay the kind of groundwork. Now, another reason why there's been so little inaction from the West is that there is now this myth amongst policymakers that, look, if we put too much pressure on Myanmar, you know, the military might step in and there might be another military coup and they'll take over. Yeah, and we don't want that. Certainly it's a flawed democracy, it's imperfect, but it's moving in the right direction. And this is a myth that's actually being perpetuated by Aung San Suu Kyi supporters in the West. And I know some of the lobby groups that they're using in London belong to you know, the friends of her, uh, her late husband uh, who are spreading some of these myths. The reality is there's going to be no military coup in Myanmar because the military is in the absolute perfect position at the moment. They have the holy grail of politics, which is power without accountability. You know, they can literally, Aung San Suu Kyi managed to get all sanctions lifted off Myanmar. The generals have enriched themselves dramatically. They have massive holdings in Singapore and China and Macau. And, you know, they have essentially, now, and they can get on with all the ethnic cleansing to the heart's extent. The last thing they want to do is invite international sanctions back on them. And Aung San Suu Kyi is preventing that. You know, so the last thing they want to do is a military coup. They can get on with running the country and running everything else and without any sort of accountability whatsoever. So we have a really a couple of actually really interesting questions that want to get at the idea of statelessness and what is the legal status of the Rohingya people and what do they have in terms of documentation? How are they able to cross borders? How are they able to prove that they were actually Rohingya and entitled to come back if there is some sort of a repatriation? Yeah. Well, the Rohingya essentially don't have any documentation at all. The only border they've cro they can cross is from Myanmar to Bangladesh. It's because they've been forced over that border. And it's interesting because the Myanmar authorities obviously pushed them over the border. And as soon as they were over the border, the border was mined. Yeah, so there's been a number of fatalities. They mine the border, so none of them actually come back. They're not allowed to cross any other border. You know, I was actually in Washington recently, and I met with a very senior official who said, you know, it'd be, it'd be very powerful if we can get a few of these Rohingya victims come over to the United States and, uh, uh, you know, speak to members of Congress you know, give their testimony of what they experience, And this would go down in a personal, very, very powerful narrative. Now, the difficulty with that is that the Rohingya have no passports. They have no citizenship. They are neither Myanmar citizens or Bengali citizens. So how do they essentially travel? You know, and this was a real complication. The Bangladeshi authorities are not, you know, willing or, you know, um, uh, able to entertain any possibility of giving them any sort of travel document. So that was a, that was a logistical challenge in itself, you know, um, uh, that these people essentially do not belong anywhere at all. You know, it's, and it was very interesting. One of the earlier trips I made to the camp, you know, Myanmar has always said that, look, we're very keen on taking these people back, you know, but if you look at the criteria and the, and the mechanism by which they were, they were, inform that Myanmar would take them back. It is designed specifically to ensure that none of them ever come back. So for example, the Rohingya had to produce documentation of uh, the birth certificates of their grandfathers. Birth certificates of their grandfathers, yeah. So at a time when birth certificates were never issued, but they had to produce do documentation of the birth certificates. Of the they had to produce documentation of which village they came from. Yeah, villages that had all been burnt down and the documentation obviously burnt down with it. They had to produce this thing. So this is the kind of material that they had to had to produce, you know, um, uh, to, to prove that they're citizens of, of Myanmar. It was all designed to ensure that none of them ever meet that criteria and none of them ever come back. So this is a very significant issue is that this is amongst the largest stateless group in the world now. You know, um, uh, no country wants them and they are essentially the lowest of the low you know, um, uh, so an, uh, another reason why this issue has not had much traction is that uh, the Rohingya, you know, are literally right at the bottom of the ladder. There's hardly anybody amongst them with an, even a basic education. You know, they've always been uh, rickshaw pullers, labourers, fishermen, and that's the only profession. There's hardly anybody, you know, even with a basic college education amongst them. And just to give you an example, there's a Rohingya cultural centre in Chicago, which is hosting uh, a few dozen Rohingya families, refugees that have come over. And I met the lady that teaches them English. And she said to me, she said, oh, Azim, she goes, it's so difficult to teach them English because most of them don't even know their own language. And most of them have never held a pen. They have physically never held a pain. So, you know, it's 
you know, this is the situation that they're in. And I remember um, uh, there was a congressional, de a congressional delegation that went out to Myanmar, and uh, the congresswoman said to me, she said, oh, look, she goes, I'd really like to meet with the Rohingya leadership before I go, the Rohingya leadership. I said, there is no Rohingya leadership. You know, if I, were if I were to mention to you another popular cause that gets a lot of coverage, you know, um, uh, the Palestinian cause, which gets a lot of media coverage, you can name me a few Palestinians. You can name me Yasser Arafat, Mahmoud Abbas, Edward Said, the academic, Gigi Hadid, the supermodel, all Palestine. I, I guarantee you, yeah, that all of you here at the World Affairs Council have come to hear a speech on the Rohingya. You're very interested in the topic, clearly. I bet you couldn't name me a single Rohingya person. You know, you couldn't name me a single Rohingya person. And this is an elite audience. There is nobody of Rohingya origin. There's nobody of Rohingya origin in Silicon Valley that's made a, you know, that can say, oh, I'm going to put $5 million of my money I made from this app into a public awareness campaign for my people. There is nobody of Rohingya origin working for the BBC or Al Jazeera or CNN that can say, look, I'm going to make this my pet project to raise awareness for my people. There's nobody of Rohingya origin elected to the British Parliament or the European Parliament or any sort of... The Rohingya are nowhere. They are the forgotten people. They are right at the bottom of the ladder. They cannot advocate for themselves. They do not have an office in K Street. There's hardly anybody amongst them with, a, with, with a base, even a basic education. These are the forgotten people, which is why this issue has had absolutely no traction. You know, they can't advocate for themselves even locally. They're all in the concentration camps, let alone internationally. So a related question is, geopolitically, has the Muslim world stepped in at all as an advocate for this Muslim minority? And then on the sort of flip side or the more worrisome side, has the Islamic State said anything about sort of their brothers in arms, etc.? Yeah. Well, first of all, Islamic uh, IS and Al Qaeda and all these other organisations made lots of statements, but really didn't get much traction. You know, they try to rouse up people. Well, you know, the next area of uh, conflict should be Myanmar. We should all go to Myanmar and focus on that. It, it didn't get any traction at all. Once again, simply because the Rohingya, are, even in the Muslim world, there's such low down the food chain. You know, and uh, in the Muslim world has has actually been very disappointing in terms of their action. Some countries have stepped in and, and given aid, <coughs> Turkey in particular, and even Saudi Arabia actually, but it's not really translated to anything anything beyond that. Simply because, the, you know, the Rohingya have really, they don't have much to offer to anybody. You know, uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel took in one, th one million Syrian refugees, one million Syrian refugees. And the reason why is because the Syrians, you know, Germany has a declining birth rate. This is a phenomenon phenomena throughout, throughout Europe, there's a declining birth rate and a growing economy needs new new bodies to keep it keep it functioning. And Angela Merkel knows that the Syrians are very entrepreneurial, they're very educated and these people make a positive contribution to the economy over the long run. The Rohingya on the other hand have really not much to offer at all if, you, if they've never held a pain. You know, so the region that they're operating in, you know, Bangladesh, India, Malaysia, Thailand, Cambodia, you know, th there's no shortage of labour in those countries. There's no shortage of people that are willing to do manual work. So none of their countries want them. Many of the Rohingya are actually sold onto the slave trade uh, in Cambodia and Thailand and, and, and so on. And, um, uh, you know, so they're really the unwanted. You know, there's, there's really not much interest in these people at all. So we, we talked earlier about hate speech and the role of Facebook and the slow response in sort of removing some of these trolls, and et cetera. What more can we be doing as an international community to combat the sort of hate speech that allows for both the dehumanization mm -hmm. of this victim group, but also just the fomenting of violence and this creating this sort of justification for a self-defense that can then be completely disproportionate? Well, this is a challenge not just in the relevant to the Rohingya situation. You know, this is a, a now a global challenge in terms of the misinformation that's now being perpetuated throughout the globe through these uh, through these technological through these technological means. So, I think well beyond that, the United States, you know, I believe, has got its own major challenges in terms of disinformation. You know, and uh, there's so much of that going around. And the purpose of this is disinformation is not necessarily to lie. Nobody lies anymore. It's all just to confuse. It's to confuse you 
you as much as possible to the extent that you can you come to the conclusion that well look it's simply not possible to know the truth in any of these situations anymore you know whether it's uh, uh, the the poisoning in, in London or elsewhere you know it's just to pr provide so many different threads of information so many possible theses that uh, it's simply not possible to know the truth it's just all just to confuse um, uh, hate, hate speech on, on the other hand you know um, uh, which is explicit and violent you know I think the responsibility should be to um, uh, uh, on the technological companies and I believe that the European Parliament in particular has, has been a little bit ahead of the game the US has been a little bit behind in terms of regulating these super uh, powerful technological companies now, uh, social media companies to try to essentially have some sort of laws to, to regulate them uh, that perpetuate this not just fake news but hate speech which can be hugely hugely damaging, you know we were talking about Facebook earlier, Facebook has been so very slow in terms of tackling some of the stuff, some of the stuff which is openly advocating violence against individuals and groups. Uh, you know, much of this is being done over platforms like Facebook. And the argument that Facebook has made, which is, which uh, if you watched Mark Zuckerberg's testimony to the US Congress, is the argument he made is that, well, look, we're still a growing company and we're, we dominate, obviously, this landscape. But if you were to regulate us, then we would obviously, we may be forced to withdraw from these markets. And these Chinese companies are going to move to this market. So do you want an American company there or do you want a Chinese company? And obviously all the members of Congress said, well, look, okay, obviously <laughs> we better have an American company there. You don't want the Chinese. And that's the, essentially the argument he made. But I, I, I don't believe that's good enough. You know, I think there has to be, I think the European Parliament provided some good models in terms of how to be a little bit more aggressive with these companies to regulate them and hold them to account. We have a question here about using sanctions as a tool to try and um, make changes in Myanmar. I know the U.S. has issued yep. some sanctions against particular individuals. What about the U.N. and Europe? How, how useful might this be? Almost, almost. you know, Europe has been, uh, it's something I, I never understood, has been so far behind on this, uh, on this particular issue. I'm not sure if it's simply because they don't understand the issue. Uh, I think part of the reason could be, and I've met policymakers, many of them who knew Aung San Suu Kyi personally, and, uh, you know, and they're essentially seduced by her and they think that she's moving in the right direction. You know, I've met with people policymakers that went to Myanmar and met with her. And, you know, Aung San Suu Kyi, she was educated at Oxford. And if you ever watch her interview, she's very softly spoken. She's very, very calm. And she makes a very strong case. And, I, you know, and if you do not know the issues well enough, you know, I, you know, I, 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 I managed to speak to some policymakers who told me off the record their conversations with her. And she just bamboozles them. Yeah. Oh, well, you know, these problems have been going on for decades in our country. There's suspicion on both sides. I've commissioned the world's leading diplomat, Kofi Annan, to look into this. And he's going to get to the truth. And it's going to take just as long to get out of it as it took us to get in. Suspicion on both sides, etc. And they come away thinking, well, she's doing what she can without, you know, and she essentially kind of just... If you do not know the issues well enough and if you don't know her background and what motivates her, then you're going to come away from these meetings thinking, well, look, she's doing she's doing what she can. In, um, uh, but uh, that's very far from the truth. So a question about, and you, you mentioned a little bit about what's happened to the former Rohingya, Rohingya villages, essentially being raised yeah. to the ground, being taken over by others. But it, there's a question about whether they've been transferred into some sort of an economic development zone taken over essentially by the state so that even if there is a repatriation, there's yeah. literally nowhere for them to go. What, what, what's happening with that? Yeah, so the land has all been, the villages were burnt down and immediately they were bulldozed. Yeah, so completely flattened and the land was redistributed to local Rakhine Buddhists and also from Buddhists, which they brought, uh, 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 Burmese nation, nationals, which they brought in from other regions. So essentially what the Myanmar authorities were trying to do is change the facts on the ground. Yeah, so the, the, the Rohingya have got nowhere to go back to. And the purpose of this is that, you know, and, and many countries do this, is that once you change the facts on the ground and a family's lived there for 10, 15 years, and then, you know, and there's some sort of agreement to bring the Rohingya back, you think, well, look, surely you don't expect us to displace this family that have now lived here for 15 years, so we have to come to some sort of other agreement, you know, and that's essentially what they've done. They've changed all the facts on the ground. You know, there's no way for the Rohingya to possibly go back to. They have built these huge uh, open-air concentration camps, and uh, if you look at the pictures, they really are, you know, huts, exactly like the World War II camps in Dashu and so on. They're literally just huts surrounded by barbed wire and patrolled, and, uh, you know, and, and all built by the Chinese. And that's essentially where they... And, and the bizarre thing is the Myanmar authorities were, were so keen to show off 
that look, we built all of this for the Rohingya. Look, we're doing what we can to bring them back. And it's really, you know, it's one of the most horrific pictures. And it's just an open air kind of concentration camp. Uh, so that's, that's, that, that is essentially the plan that the Myanmar authorities have for the Rohingya, that any of them that come back. And none of them have gone back, none of them. Um, so uh, the, the repatriation was supposed to start, I think, last week. And the Bangladesh said that, you know, nobody will be forced to go back. They have to be. So they drew up a list of, I think, 2,000 Rohingya that, have, that were going back. And uh, none of them none of them wanted to go back, not a single one, because nothing has changed. None of the conditions the geno of the genocide, the underlying conditions, the people in power, nothing has changed. You know, and the the fact is that the Rohingya that are remaining in Rakhine, who the international community has no longer access to, are still experiencing vast amounts of violence. You know, many of them are literally being starved to death now. You know, and in, in the UN, even the UN does not have access to them. You know, so there's not much of an incentive to go back. So we got two more questions before I think we'll close the public and, and recorded version of this event. Um, first, in the in the public consciousness, we think about Buddhism as being a nonviolent religion. Yep. How do we square that, or how do individuals justify the degrees of violence that are being perpetrated against their compatriots? Yeah. So the form of Buddhism they follow in, in Myanmar is not the Buddhism that you and I may be most familiar with. It's not the Buddhism of the Dalai Lama. You know, it's just a form of Buddhism called Theravada Buddhism, which can lend itself to very violent kind of nationalist undertones. So I think the best example I can possibly give you is, is essentially like Islam, which is a, a religion, you know, of over a billion people. And then you have a strand within it, you know, Wahhabism, Salafism, which is ultra conservative. And from that image, Emerges, you know, from Wahhabism emerges a brand called jihadism, which is violent in its nature. But the conservative kind of groundwork intellectual foundation is laid by Wahhabism, and from that emerges jihad. I, I think that's probably the best example I'd give you. The form of Buddhism they follow in Myanmar is Theravada Buddhism, which can, which can an offshoot of that can be very militant and very violent. And uh, they don't recognize the Dalai Lama. Some of them think that he's an actual fraud. Um, uh, you know, and uh, and if you listen to the, the the sermons of some of these Buddhist monks, you know it's very clear the, how openly and all of these are available on YouTube. I've, I've written a couple of articles on them. You can go to YouTube and see them. Uh, you know, one of the, the one of the main perpetrators of the violence, uh, instigating the violence, is a, is a monk called Ashin Warathu, and he was on the cover of Time magazine because he des he described himself as being the Buddhist Bin Laden. Even though later he said he withdrew those um, remarks, he described himself as being the Buddhist Bin Laden. And he's a quite a strange kind of individual because Buddhism, you know, one of the reasons they wear the orange garb is not just as a, as a color of peace, but it's also of simplicity that you've kind of withdrawn from the world and you've um, uh, kind of turned your back to materialism and, and uh, you know, worldly, worldly uh, possessions. And he, he's an individual that wears like a $20,000 watch and he's got, uh, you know, Louis Vuitton luggage, and he's got like a six hundred dollar pair of sunglasses, and he flies on a private jet. And you see him all kind of, and it's very, it very, doesn't match the kind of the, the Buddhist kind of garb. It's, it's quite quite strange. Another key, and and he's openly openly advocated violence against the Rohingya. Another uh, key individual is actually one of the most senior monks in Myanmar. Is an individual called uh, Sitago. And uh, you can watch one of his sermons on YouTube in which he's literally giving a speech to a room full of army officers. And each one of the, see, after the Saffron Revolution, when the Buddhist monks rose up against the, against the Myanmar uh, military at that time, the Myanmar military realized that, look, to avoid this happening again, that each of the military divisions, each of the kind of regiments now has a, a patron monk to kind of represent them and to bless them. So they, there's a very close relationship between the monks and the military now. And you can see this sermon by by Sitago. He's sitting on a, a chair very high up and there's, all, there's a room, hall full of army officers all sitting on the floor. And he's telling a story. And the story is essentially a, a, a Burmese king, a Buddhist king who killed a number of people and he couldn't sleep at night because he felt so guilty of killing these people. And the monks, because they have a special insight, realize that the king is uneasy. And so in the middle of the night, these four monks visit this king and they tell him that, look, we, we know that you're feeling guilty and you can't sleep because of the, the guilt that you're feeling. But these people that you killed, they were not Buddhists. So they were only half human. They're only half human. So you have no need to feel guilty. 
Yeah, so this is a kind of retro, and so he's telling an arm, a room full of army officers, and the, and the implication is very clear that you non-Buddhists are only half human, and on top of that, you can see sermons in which they describe the Rohingya as being reincarnated from snakes and insects. So very similar to the kind of Rwandan kind of uh, terminology. So when you're killing them, when you're persecuting, you're not actually killing humans. It's actually vermin that you're cleaning, that you're cleaning out. You know, them, uh, so th this militant form of Buddhism has played a very large role. You know, and even the announcement was made that the Rohingya are being repatriated. This was just a couple of weeks ago. The protests were all led by the monks. And you can see them all in their orange garb saying, well, look, no Rohingya on our land. You know, Rohingya, go home, and et cetera. You know, so I'm, um, that's been a very, very significant feature of, uh, of this entire exercise. So final question, um, what is next for you? You've written this tremendous book. You're a prolific op-ed writer. You're meeting with the highest echelons of mm. governments around the world advocating on behalf of this most persecuted of populations. What do you see as the next steps for you and your own advocacy here? Yeah, so I'm working now on trying to set up a new academic centre uh, called the Centre for Rohingya Studies at uh, University College London. And uh, it's still in the early stages at the moment, but uh, I'm hoping it'll be operational soon. And the purpose of this centre is essentially, it will have three functions. Uh, first of all, it'll be a documentation centre in which we investigate and document all the crimes against the Rohingya and create a data bank that can then be used by future scholars, historians, and any possible tribunals or anything else that may come to pass. That's the first function is the documentation centre. The second function will be to look at medium to long-term solutions for the Rohingya crisis. I don't believe that there is a solution anymore to this crisis. I believe that there's lots of small things that the international community can do to ameliorate the situation of the of the Rohingya. And, uh, and the, the Rohingya provide a very unique sample a unique situation because there's 1.2 million of them in the largest refugee camp in the world. The refugee population in, in the world is the highest it's ever been in history. It's 86 million refugees globally. And this is only going to increase because of climate change and because of demographical changes, the demographical explosion that will occur over the next 40 years. So the tools that we can develop because we have such a large sample size here with 1.2 million, they can then be applied to other refugee situations, you know, much more smaller and manageable ones, like the Congo and South Sudan, et cetera. So that's the second function is to look at a policy, a policy, policy solutions. The third function is essentially an ethnographic centre, is to look at Rohingya identity and try to document it. The Rohingya are, are, to me, they're almost like the Native Americans. Their entire civilization has now been wiped out. You know, what will it mean to be a Rohingya one generation from now? You know, what will happen to their language, their culture, their way of life is all going to be diluted in refugee camps around the globe. And so there has to be a mechanism by which to try to preserve some of that. Yeah, so I'm... I'm working on that at the moment and hopefully I have it uh, operational quite soon. Fantastic. That's a lot to take in. Please join me in thanking Dr. Azeem Ibrahim.